Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Just before we get started, could I ask you to just take a moment to please check that your mobile phones are switched to silent? Thank you very much for that. My name is Jane Ward, Vice President for Engagement at Swinburne, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here this evening and privileged to welcome you to Swinburne's annual Chancellor's Lecture. I would like to start, as is the custom at Swinburne, by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to all Aboriginal el community elders, past, present and emerging, who have resided in this area and been an integral part of the history of this region. We certainly have a wonderful evening ahead. And to begin, it's my pleasure to invite Swinburne's Chancellor, Mr Graham Goldsmith, to the lectern. Thank you, Graham. Thank you very much, Jane. And I'll, I'll start by uh, that I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay respects to all Aboriginal community elders, past, present and emerging, who've resided in the area and been an integral part of the history of this region. A special welcome this evening to former Chancellor Dr Bill Scales AO, Vice-Chancellor Professor Linda Christensen AO, fellow members of the Swinburne University Council, members of the Swinburne Executive and other distinguished guests. It is certainly my great pleasure to welcome everyone to Swinburne for this year's Chancellor's Lecture. Each year I'm proud to host this important public event and it's wonderful to see so many people have joined us this evening. I was commenting to Bill earlier, a few years ago we were in a much smaller room uh, over to my left um, and this year there are not very many seats in the house at all. Health innovations are at the core of Swinburne's future. In recent years, we have made a concentrated effort to strengthen our study offerings and research initiatives in this important area. We have revamped our Bachelor of Health Sciences alongside the introduction of a Bachelor of Nursing, a Master of Dietetics, Master of Occupational Therapy, Bachelor of Exercise and Sports Science, and we have plans for further health courses. As part of this expansion, we have been developing a health precinct at our Hawthorne campus here, giving students access to state-of-the-art innovations from their very first days of study. Indeed, just before our last council meeting, council visited and reviewed the new facilities. The precinct features new laboratories designed for studying anatomy, biomechanics, exercise physiology, strength and conditioning, motor learning, nutrition and dietetics, and fitted with the latest equipment and technology, as I'm sure you'd expect from a university of technology. We're also striving to make social impact through our leading health innovations research. Stem cell technology developed at Swinburne will be used to grow the massive number of stem cells required for a new handheld 3D printer to be used in surgery to repair damaged cartilage. The technology is part of a collaboration with St Vincent's Hospital to support the development of BioPen, a groundbreaking project led by this evening's speaker, Professor Peter Chung. Last month, Swinburne PhD candidate Greg Kennedy received the 2018 Alzheimer Award, presented by the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. He was recognised for the first published paper of his PhD and is also the first person in the Southern Hemisphere to win this award. Greg and his colleagues examined the potential pathways through which exercise may maintain or improve cognitive functioning. These are just two of Swinburne's more recent accomplishments in the health innovations research space. As we speak, many more of our people are working on their own breakthroughs. And it is philanthropic support and generosity that enables great strides in health care that we all depend upon to live healthy, longer lives. Beginning in 2009, the Chancellor's Lecture Series was envisioned as a program for Swinburne alumni, friends and staff to hear prominent experts share their insights on the important issues of the 21st century. 
Almost a decade on, I'm proud to say this series continues to grow and attract a wide audience of people who are interested to hear from those making a difference in the world. And this brings me to this evening's guest, Professor Peter Chung. Professor Chung is Director of Orthopaedics at St Vincent's Hospital, the Sir Hugh Devine Professor of Surgery and the Head of the Department of Surgery at the University of Melbourne. He also chairs the Bone and Soft Tissue Sarcoma Service at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and is a recent past president of the Australian Orthopaedic Association. As a visionary and pioneer in limb sparing surgery, Professor Chung's expertise has offered new hope to patients around the world. As mentioned earlier, he is also leading the Biopen musculoskeletal research program at St Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne, which involves Swinburne's biosphere technology. The work is driven by a multidisciplinary approach that brings together a coalition of cell biologists, polymer scientists, metallurgists and surgeons. It is really a privilege to have Professor Chung here tonight and to gain an insight into the groundbreaking work that he is doing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Chung for a surgeon's journey, innovating cancer care through science, dreams and hope. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, members of council, ladies and gentlemen and friends, to that I add Amelia and Lynn Iverson, whose father and husband was a great friend of mine as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity of presenting here tonight. It's truly an honour. And when I sit here looking up at all the faces um, staring down at me, I'm wondering what are people doing on such a, a lovely night, one of very few that we have in Melbourne in winter. But indeed what I'd like to talk about is, is really about the journey that I've had to take, some of the the steps I had to face and, and what a joy it's been in such a journey of discovery that I've had. And who you have before you at the moment, that's my grandfather. And three years uh, before he was born, man first took flight over Kitty Hawk. And when he died, he'd crossed the world in a 747. And often when I was small, I would I would want to ask him that one of my greatest regrets is that I didn't. What was it like to pass through all that? What was it like to, to begin life at a time when everything, inverted commas, simple, and, and at the end of your life see all that change? So during his life, our survival increased from 50 at the turn of the last century to about 85, where it sits now. And through that period of time, there were a considerable number of advances. And what was interesting about that is in the first half of it, it was about public health. The things that we could do as a community, discoveries that helped a community survive longer, do better, and, and enjoy the prospects of a better life. But in the second half of the last century, it was really interesting. If you look at that, they were more targeted at things that people could do individually. Technology was becoming far more common, and it was a driver of many of the different um, progress, points of progress that we've made. So something happened around the 60s that really changed that paradigm. And when you look back at the advances over the last century, there was actually a specific time. I won't call it a moment, because a moment would suggest one and only one thing, but I, I, I believe it was a change of thinking of, of humankind at that time. So in, in looking through the history, and, and I, I love following history, I think that has a, a lot to do with where we've been and where we should go, I'm impressed by the fact that John F. Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. It was a step beyond the thinking of many. We fantasized about that. But an entire country 
decided to do what was previously thought impossible. And his point, which is very much echoed by researchers of today, was it was a challenge that we simply had to take. It was a, a challenge that we could not wait for and it demanded our attention right now. And so in response to that, three months later I was born. <laughs> and, and so my life, certainly to the impressionable period of my life, was influenced tremendously by fantasy, by dreams, by people proposing to do things that at that time we would think what was just a play, it was just an idea, technology would never get us there, it's too far. And yet I was brought up at a time when man first stepped on the moon. Imagine that, that day, what, were, what was going on in our lives. I was brought up with the, the Space Odyssey 2001, the fantastic journey of miniaturizing something and using that miniature something to solve a problem. How far have we come? So let's get back to the, the title of what I'm talking about tonight, which is cancer, and my role as a sarcoma surgeon. So every tissue is defined by certain cells. Those types of cells will determine what the organ is. And when something goes wrong and cancer occurs, certain cells lead to the development of very specific type of cancers. And I like to think of an organ like a brick wall. They're the bricks, and they're often just one type, whether they're clinker or yellow brick or whatever you like. And then there's the mortar between the bricks that support the bricks. Carcinomas are the cancers of the bricks. They're the cell type. So you have the lung cancer, the prostate cancer, and the breast cancer. Sarcomas is the area that I deal with. They're the cancers of the mortar. And what it means is that sarcomas can occur everywhere that bricks occur. Everywhere that you have a cell that is supported, you can have a sarcoma. So 200 years ago, John Abernethy, a pathologist, discovered and described for the first time sarcoma. And 50 years after he described it, surgeons were already declaring how um, how dangerous and how malignant this type of cancer was and how its return was such that it came back with a vengeance. A hundred years after that, this man circled in red, Sir Stanford Cade, he was a surgeon. He was also a radiation oncologist. He was a preeminent oncologist at the time who had a focus on sarcoma. And here he is on the steps of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh about to open their annual scientific meeting. His words are in reference to sarcoma. If you don't amputate, they die. Amputate and they still die. So let's just close this meeting with a prayer. <laughs> the modern perspective of sarcoma is it's rare. Only two to four per hundred thousand people will get a sarcoma. A GP might see one in a lifetime. A specialist orthopedic surgeon might see at most four or five in a lifetime. I might see three or four a week as they channel into what we see now as a multidisciplinary specialist based practice of sarcoma. If you look at breast cancer, one in eight to 10 women, prostate cancer, one in eight to 10 men. It means that it's 10,000 times less common, and yet it is one of the most common pediatric cancers, accounting for up to one fifth with a mortality of 50%. Its per capita lifetime cost is the sixth highest for Australia, equ equivalent to colorectal and breast cancer combined. And we look at the burden of disease up to 17 life years are lost a person with sarcoma. So where did my journey be begin? I was a registrar at St Vincent's Hospital, that is a, a trainee, at a time when we were servicing the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre as the orthopaedic department who looked after bone and soft tissue tumours. And there were two particular cases that are at the origin of where my journey began. One was a gentleman who had a cancer in his neck, 
in the cervical, in the, in the vertebra. And the other one was another gentleman who had a cancer of his arm. And we treated this in a way that was suggested at that time. They were unstable, they needed the plates and the screws, and it looked fantastic after surgery. But within weeks, both failed because we had not appreciated what the behavior of these tumors were like. We had not appreciated how, in our minds, modern technology and modern care would be affected by a disease process that respected nothing unless you knew how it worked. And unfortunately, both of these patients died miserable deaths, perhaps contributed to by my hands as well. So understanding the behavior of sarcoma became one of my driving um, goals. And so starting off in, in Australia, one of the first ports of call was Sweden. It was the center of sarcoma studies at that time back in the early 1900s. They go back obviously beyond that. But they were really specialists in interrogating uh, the tumor, interrogating the genetics of the tumor, and many of, of what, much of what we know today in the genetics and the chromosomal abnormalities of this cancer and many others do arise from Sweden. It's here where I met with a man called Anders Ridholm, and he was the leader of the Scandinavian Sarcoma Group. And it, he was one of the first to, to define the principles of how should you actually manage this thing. What, what were the safe margins that surgeons had to think about? Because when Samuel Gross said, 50 years after this tumor was um, first described, that it's a terrible tumor, he was blaming the tumor. The reality was it was actually the surgeon who was at fault because the surgeon wasn't treating the tumor in the manner it should have been treated. And so there was a real understanding around about the late eight, uh, 1980s to early 1990s of how you should start to manage this. And I think I was very lucky to enter at a time where there was a cusp of knowledge, the beginning of a new way of treating sarcoma. At that time, across in Gainesville, Florida, was Bill Enneking. Bill actually um, described specific margins, the four margins of intralesional, marginal, wide, and radical margins that now define how these cancers should actually be excised. And growing from this knowledge, as the specialty of sarcoma surgery grew, more and more people took a very distinct interest. And, and in fact, it's our colleagues just across the straits in Japan who spent a lot of time interrogating tissue to find out what equivalent distance away from the tumor do specific tissues bring. So for example, if you have a very fine gossamer around the tumor, what is it equivalent to if you kept that gossamer around, that veil of tissue around the tumor? What if it was bone that was between you and the tumor? What if it was cartilage? And so they were able to say this is equivalent to one centimeter, two centimeters, five centimeters. And we know that there is a rule that you should be no, no closer than the equivalent of about three centimeters from a tumor that you resect. So that has been incredibly helpful for surgeons who have to play with the anatomy and know at what point do you resect the tumor. These are some of my, the fellows who, who have worked with me over the last two decades. So they described where the lining of the bone is equivalent to three or five, and if you see uh, tumors such as on your right hand side with the arrows, how you might attempt to resect that. The, the luster of, of a shiny, what we call a fascia or a coating, uh, is, signi signifies a much thicker barrier of soft tissue, and that might be equivalent to two centimeters, for example. And so between the thin and the thick barriers, the science of margins was understood, and today is at the basis of the types of surgery that we do. So after a year in, in Sweden, um, I then journeyed to the Mayo Clinic where there was a completely different brand of oncology being practiced at that time. In, in uh, the United States, the Mayo was one of perhaps four different sites that was said to be the Fonz at Origo, the start of sarcoma care and the description of that. I was extremely lucky. It, it, it was the Mayo Clinic that, that started this group, the International Society of Limb Salvage, which was to study the research, academia, and science of um, how you manage tumors, how you look to reconstruct them, repair them, at what points do you bring radiotherapy and chemotherapy, so on and so forth. And it's really interesting that there are some people in this picture taken in, in the mid-80s 
uh, who, who I see today, and every now and then I'll flick it up just to taunt them, I think. But, but this is the Mayo group whom I worked with when I got there, and this gentleman in the black and white to the top here was David Darlene, who wrote the Darlene's Text of Bone Tumors, and that gentleman in black and white was Jack Ivins, who was uh, the original uh, leader of that group. I was lucky enough to be the Ivins professor for a period of time, and my um, introduction to David Darlene at Mayo Clinic was interesting. I was going up to the 14th floor of Mayo Clinic, and I got in there and I met this gentleman who was in his green jacket calling out the floors, and he was telling me all about this place, and I told him what I was doing. And um, that was David Darlene. He had just retired. And he gave back to the Mayo Clinic by being someone who ushered patients backwards and forwards, and it was very, very interesting. But it was at Mayo Clinic that they started to design these modular implants so people didn't have to have amputations anymore. We could actually learn, because we knew now about the science of how we cut these things out, how could we actually rebuild them with blocks of metal in certain ways. So they flex, they extend, they turn, and if done appropriately, it'd be hard to guess which leg has that prosthesis. And this gentleman here has an entire femur that's been replaced, which includes the hip and the knee. And this showed us what was actually possible with the types of prostheses that we can use. This was a, a prosthesis that was just being introduced at the time that I was there. And it's actually made of a polymer. And you put it into that circle thing, which is like a miniature MRI. It's a magnetic field. And if you flick the magnetic field, it has a charge, it warms up things, and it melts the plastic, that polymer. And inside that polymer is a spring. So when the plastic melts, the spring extends and the leg grows longer. So we put it in kids, because kids grow. And they come in every so often, and you put them in the next room, and you turn the little magnet on, you walk out for 15 minutes, see the next patient, you come back in. The key is not to spend more than 15 minutes outside the room. <laughs> but what we also learned at this time was how can we use biologic material? Because one of the things is actually to rebuild people. Because if you can rebuild people biologically, it's much more durable, much more sustainable. And what it does is it gives back the stock of bone or tissue, whatever it is, such that in the future, should you require, you can actually use that piece of bone again. And so we learn about uh, bone that you might take, bone grafts, with or without its blood vessels, so-called vascularized bone graft. We talk about the use of bone from bone banks, so on and so forth. But what allowed me as a surgeon, and surgeons like me, to really prosper in the field of advancing science was the fact that we had incredible advances in, in medical imaging. Because as surgeons, we need to see where we're going. And, and magnetic resonance imaging, the so-called MRI, computer tomography, CT scans, gave you a very clear perspective of, of that. In fact, those two modalities had such an impact on all of medicine that the scientists and the mathematicians who worked out the algorithms actually got Nobel Prizes for that because it made such an impact on life as we know it. And so you could look at anatomy and see through a person's body. We're able to actually pass them through these things and see tiny little blood vessels that we couldn't imagine have been seen, perhaps only 10 years before that time. But now they're getting better and stronger and more accurate. And you can really discern things about the human body that previously you couldn't, which allows surgeons like me to decide where the margins should be. Even CT scans, which were developed long before MRIs, have really changed in, and evolved that you can create 3D pictures now. You can colorize it so you know which is a vein, which is an artery, which are the lymph vessels, so on and so forth. Of course, functional imaging, which is not just how something looks, but how something behaves, so-called PET scans are important. It's, it's a way of saying, does that tumor there, is it like a factory working over time, or is it like an empty warehouse sitting there doing nothing? Because that has a sense, gives you a sense of the biology, and therefore how you might treat that tumor. So the United States was also a place where radiotherapy really got in with surgery. And this is James Ewing, after whom the tumor, the Ewing's tumor was named. And James Ewing was a pathologist. 
and he had a real interest in the emerging field of radiation and how that could be used in medicine. In fact, he got a grant from Congress, it's, it's not many grants passed by Congress in the US, to actually set up a research center at the Sloan Kettering to look at how radiotherapy could be used. And because of that, Ewing sarcoma now is known to be very effectively treated in combination with radiotherapy, but so many other principles of how radiotherapy could be used. And in fact, it's a very modern field of image-guided radiotherapy now that we see. There are two sorts of radiotherapies. There's ones where the old rays, you know, the X-rays are, are sent out to, to kill the tumour. And those rays occur when particles collide and release energy and we hone that energy in and we target certain areas. But today, we're not just looking at the rays. We're actually even looking at the particles that are sent out, so-called particle beams. And Australia is in the running at the moment to, to get, hopefully with, with government sponsorship, um, proton beam therapy or carbon ion beam therapy. I was, I was up in Sydney recently speaking to the role of carbon ion therapy. And if I want to send any of my patients for carbon ion therapy, I send them to Japan, one with the biggest experience in this area um, for sarcoma. Our radiotherapists, like surgeons, I, I call them surgeons because they cut a tumour out with radiotherapy. They have margins, just like I have margins. They even play with the same toys I play with, infrared cameras that allow the device to fire at, at the tumour as the patient breathes, because as the patient breathes, the, the gun moves with the breath, whichever way it wants to go, so it can be incredibly accurate, so-called cyber knife. And this is um, hopefully a, a picture that we will see here in Australia one day in the, ro the, the role of particle beams. We use extracorporeal irradiation where, for example, this is a cancer of a pelvis, that's the hip joint, and just above the hip joint, you'll see a round circle, that's the tumour. And in this particular case, I was able to cut out the pelvis, run it across to Peter McCallum, pop it in a box, and my buddies at Peter McCallum pressed the button and zapped the living daylights out of it, grabbed the box, ran back to St Vincent's, and popped it straight back in the patient. <laughs> so, so that's called extracorporeal irradiation. And we have to surround that with a lot of water that, that, so that the x-rays pass through and give to the, the bone just the, the, the concentration of, of, of uh, radiotherapy dose. The only thing is that box, when you calculate it, is, 100, is um, 100 litres. Is that right? No, 40 litres. And my poor resident who had to run across the road with this, I thought it was just a box, but he filled it up with the fluid first. And I told him next time you just take the bone across and put the fluid in when you get on the other side. <laughs> this man here is Norman Jaffe. Norman was the very first chemotherapist to really alert us to the role of chemotherapy for sarcoma. And how it came about in one particular case that he latched onto was there, there was um, a family whose son got a, uh, an osteosarcoma of the leg and they were not prepared to have uh, treatment which was de rigueur at that time, which was amputation. They wanted that leg to be saved. So it would take six weeks for an implant to be built to replace that leg. So they thought, well, we need to do something. So they gave this patient methotrexate, at that time very successful in gynecological cancers. And then when they cut the, the tumour out six weeks later to replace it with this implant, they discovered that there was over 90% necrosis or death of the tumour. And that was how serendipity brought together osteosarcoma and chemotherapy. And so studies were conducted by Norman Jaffe looking at people with metastatic disease, that is when it's spread, really end of life situations. And, and to his surprise, he was able to get patients into remission or demonstrate a response. And soon after him, Lucius Singh's conducted the first randomized controlled trial comparing the treatment of osteosarcoma, surgery alone or surgery with chemotherapy, and in this case, this drug called adriamycin, and demonstrated a doubling of the survival rate, and then the rest is history. So chemotherapy is so much part of what we do today for sarcoma. But there remains ongoing challenges. Although we feel we've reached a limit, and you know, we haven't been able to bump past about 75, 80% in, in five years survival. We've reached that plateau, 
It was very low. When I was a medical student finishing, li uh, finishing studies in, in the, the, the early 80s, it was a 15% five-year survival for osteosarcoma. We sit at about 80% now. Very few cancers that were absolutely fatal and vicious could be said to improve to that degree. And it really is a testament to the team approach that we have. So we have challenges in how we deal with the poorly responsive tumours to patients where they come back, to all the patients who cannot tolerate standard dose of chemotherapy. Because they can't tolerate it, we drop the dose. When you drop the dose, it's less effective. When it's, it's less effective, but they still get sick. They still suffer the morbidity of that. And finally, soft tissue sarcoma is not that responsive to chemotherapy. And yet they're there, and we have to do something about it. So like with everything else, our technology has allowed us to explore cells. It has allowed us to understand how cells behave, the mechanisms. And management of cancer has now gone from the machines to the molecules. As a surgeon now, I'm not just operating to put, with machines to put implants in. I have to operate at the cellular level, at the subcellular level, and I'm part of teams that look at managing these cancers now through the genetic manipulation of, of the tumour. So we look at manipulating the gene, which is part of a very, very long molecule called the DNA, and the DNA is packaged quite carefully in each cell. But because the DNA is a chromosome, because it's so special, we make another one of it. So there's a pair of them around. So if one goes bung, there's the other side. And, and we have a set of chromosomes tucked right at the center of the cell in the nucleus, the most protected area. And understanding how that works has become the challenge for so many, both in fundamental science as well as clinical science. So in my world of sarcoma, the signature of sarcoma is that we have translocations. One part of a chromosome swaps with another chromosome. So you have chromosome A being part of B and B being part of A. And what happens when you want to do something with the chromosome is you create a message of the DNA. That message is then translated by a little um, translator that sticks on the message and it runs down. We call that a ribosome. And once it translates it, it spits out a protein which is the product of that message. But because the protein was made from a message that is from two different chromosomes rather than one, it's a bit garbled. Sometimes it's not just garbled, it actually signals the wrong protein to be made. And as such, you have biological actions that are a bit aberrant. Abnormal cell growth, cells that multiply, and cells that don't die. And that's all cancer is, something that continues to multiply and takes up the space that is not its to have and starves other um, uh, organs out of normal function. What we find, though, is that for the sarcomas, there are so many unique translocations and unique so much so that we are able to diagnose the tumour from the translocation we identify. We're able to say which genes cause it, and we know that certain genes are associated with certain prognosis. So now we can say, depending on what gene is out, what your prognosis is, and we can talk more purposefully with our patients. We, we know which genes produce what protein. We know the mechanism of how that abnormality is occurring within the cell. And if you know the mechanism of how things go wrong, perhaps that's the first clue of how we can battle and tackle that. And in fact, what we've found is that there's so many different signals that occur when abnormal proteins get exposed to the antennae that stick out of our cell. That's a cell membrane. All these antennae stick out. Let's call them receptors. And each is powered by a different chemical system. And some of these chemical systems we know about. We know what blocks them. We know what causes them to to express themselves more. So if you know which part of the protein sits on which antenna, you might just go dismantle that antenna. And in fact, that's what is starting to happen. 
Here is an example of a sarcoma that I might have to deal with. A long name, dermatofibroma sarcoma protuberans, but because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, we call it DFSP. It is an abnormality in a translocation between one type of tissue called collagen and another factor called PDGF. And when the two get together, you have unrestricted growth. What we know is that the, the, the product of that is driven by a system by the name tyrosine kinase. But we also know that we've got products that can block the action of tyrosine kinase. So we try that, and it's absolutely amazing. This is one, one of the different cancers where the drug called Gleevec has had a substantial effect. So this is an unfortunate lady who came from Asia to see us with this huge lump growing out of her head. She'd had it for many, many years, treated by surgery, treated by radiotherapy, she'd been given chemotherapy. And what you're looking at there is her skull. They'd burnt away all the skin and this big knob sitting there. And the only way to treat this really up until then was to actually take her entire top of her head off. Not compatible with life. <laughs> so at that time we realized that this, this thing called Gleevec that can block the type of mechanism that drives this tumor. And you can see in a very short number of months the disappearance of that. And up to three years before we lost contact with her overseas, she maintained a disease-free state, demonstrating the power of understanding the molecular nature of our diseases. So with all, those th all, all that, sooner or later the fun's over. I've got to get back to Melbourne. But in fact, that's when the fun really started. And it was an absolute pleasure to be invited to lead the bone and soft tissue sarcoma service at Peter McCallum and St. Vincent's in the mid-90s. And very soon we were able to build together a multidisciplinary team that is actually the way cancer should be treated today. Not by one person, not by one specialist, but by groups of specialists and experts who can give a distilled wisdom and eke out every last bit of expertise we can have to produce the best outcome. So this is the team at, this is one of the early pictures of the team at Peter McCallum. And of course it's somewhat larger today, our sarcoma team, and people do come and uh, in and out. But what the Cancer Council of Victoria did show was when they looked at the quadrennia of treatment, every four-year block, what we noticed in the later ones from the mid-90s onwards was that there was an improvement in survival. At that time, may I say, surgery hadn't changed, radiotherapy hadn't changed, and chemotherapy hadn't changed. What had changed was the way we did it. It was the groupthink. It was the debates. It was the distilled wisdom that was coming out. And that, we believe, and it's certainly shown today, was how it worked. But being an orthopedic surgeon, we were able to capitalize on changing technology. And I use robots, for example, not robots, a computer-guided surgery. It's like flying a plane when I do joint replacement, whether it's for the hip or the knee, so on and so forth. You get your alignment, rather than the rule of thumb, yeah, we're kind of straight. We actually use infrared markers in surgery to, to give the level of accuracy and leveraging that in my other life, which is as a cancer surgeon, we're able to use this to target, pinpoint target cancers in bone for biopsy, for, for burning with electrical probes, and also for marking out the boundaries for accurate surgery. We now even bring CT scanners into surgery and scan people on, on the, the operating um, table and use that information, pump it into a computer that then guides me real time as to how I might do surgery on, on these bony tumours. Here's an example of, of a pelvic tumour, a young boy with a pelvic tumour that I was able to resect very accurately in a very, very um, difficult and challenging area of his pelvis and get through and remove that tumour without damaging structures, all with the use of computer guidance. And the next big um, disruptor, as it were, and we all know it, it's 3D printing. So resecting things obviously invites the question, so what's next? How do you fill the gap? Well, 3D printing has provided us a solution in that. And, and for those who don't know, 3D printing is about telling the computer, I want you to build a pattern like my hand. And you print it layer by layer until you give it that three dimension that makes up accurate copy of my hand, or in this case, part of a turbine. 
So when you have a problem like this at the end of a thigh bone, a tumor, traditionally I would just cut the bottom of the thigh bone off, take it away and put a big prosthesis there, which would mean that you would sacrifice what may be a normal knee. So what accurate surgery plus 3D printing allows us to now think about is can you actually cut out that tumor and with that space build, a, build a, a, an implant specific to that patient that allows it to be um, uh, now made part of the human body. Here is an example of a patient where we did just that. We resected his, his heel bone and we replaced it with a direct replica of that allowing him movement, weight bearing. And that was just the start of this concept of using 3D printed devices. And since that time, we've expanded it to other areas, for example, the shoulder, the shoulder blade, uh, the arm. But very soon, another disruptive force came, robots. Then came the robots. And so robots are guided by data that we can pump into it. And the same data that I use for my joint replacement surgery, where I'm the robot moving, I now put into this device. And this device is able to very, very accurately remove bone in a way that allows um, a predetermined prosthesis to be inserted into place. So from that then we have a way of cutting the bone out, we have a way of looking at what parts should be cut out. We have image-guided surgery, so we need to build the implant. And it really, Australia is really at the forefront of that. So partnering with the colleagues at RMIT, where they have the Advanced Manufacturing Precinct, one of, one of Australia's um, premier sites for the research into 3D printing, we will be able to come up with ideas of building bone that aren't just metal blocks, but behave like bone, has the same physical characteristics as bone, and because it's so much like bone, the real bone doesn't know it yet, but that metal block sitting there is actually metal, not bone. And because of that, it interacts with the metal in a way that is very, very similar to how it might yet interact with bone graft. So putting it all together, that gave rise to this concept of just in time. So if someone, for example, has a tumor in bone, you can scan that, you can get all that information which allows us to think, well, where should we make the cuts that spares that joint? We then input that information into a robot and we use the robot to help us very, very accurately cut out that tumour. At the same time, the robot is acquiring information about what it's doing and it would send that information together with information about the actual piece that was excised, scanned and placed back into a computer that then generates the sorts of product that absolutely resembles the same characteristics of that part of the bone that you removed. That is then pumped into, into a printer and using very special laser techniques, 3D prints up the type of, of product that you could then put in. And we call it just in time because that's the aspiration. As I operate here, information is then being passed to the room next door to produce this. And what that's done is it's really driven an entire industry around the, the logistics of how could you actually achieve that. And as a group, we were able to, um, to be successful at a, at a cooperative research centre and be uh, funded to look at this over the next seven years. But I guess for me, as a cancer surgeon, Removing people's limbs is a huge emotional challenge for my patients. Trying to find an appropriate solution for them is my challenge. And that remains my Everest, I guess, because it brings together a, a concept of replacing in an ad hoc way, or rather replacing something that was removed in an ad hoc way, which you couldn't really determine what you could do before. So, how do we use robots and the surgery that we've done to give people hope of, of actually having a functional limb like they had in the past? So to do that, collaborated with my colleagues, Danny Otomo, who leads the robotics group at University of Melbourne, and we came together and said, now what can we do to really look at refining the way robot, robots can be used and robotic limbs can be created? Now, robotic limbs aren't new. We've had that since the mid-60s. 
But how do you sophisticate it so it's small, it's light, it's working, and it's consistent in its use today? So we started a plan of, of research over the last four or five years. And up here, it just shows you the classic way of uh, running robots today. You contract a muscle. The contraction signal is picked up. It's passed through a computer, and the robot uh, uh, responds to those signals that comes through the skin. The second panel, you can train the robot if you have the right digits to do certain things. And in the third panel across um, in the far, you can actually individually move fingers. And this is the prototype that we have now that we've got, one that can be used that moves fingers, moves hands and wrists, and can actually help train patients who've just lost their arm uh, it, before they actually get the definitive prosthesis. But the challenge I put to the team was this. This is the whole team. Wouldn't it be interesting to overcome the problems of today's robotic limbs, which are, Australia's a hot place. It gets pretty sweaty when you put one of those things on. And when you have sweaty skin, the transmission of the signal is very bad. So sometimes you want to open, you close, and when you want to close, you open, and sometimes nothing works at all. So how do we make that better? And so one of the dreams was, perhaps we can tissue engineer connections between robots and the human body. Let's tissue engineer skeletal muscle. Let's guide the nerves to regenerate back to those tissue engineered skeletal muscles. Let's create the junctions between those nerves and the skeletal muscle. And perhaps by the intent of the existing apparatus that exists, fire off that tissue engineered uh, muscle that then talks to the robot and at the same time receives impulses back from the robot that can be sent back to the brain. So, so that really is the challenge that we're now moving into in our robotic limb work. So, so that's Rob Kapser and Anita Quigley, and they were one of the first to look at tissue engineering skeletal muscle. And so we teamed up with them to have a look at how can you actually take this forward. This is Catherine Ngan. She's our PhD student. She's a, a surgical resident of mine. And her challenge was to come up with the modern use of biomaterials and 3D printing to actually create skeletal muscle, which she has done with great success over the last two to three years. That's Bill Zhang. He's my orthopedic registrar. And I said to him, Bill, you know, we need to get a connection between the nerves and this stuff. How about you go find me some neuromuscular junctions? And so he spent his PhD looking for ways of creating the connection between nerves and muscles and found it. And he worked out models in which this might actually occur. So I said, let's create a model that people can understand, Bill. So together, working with Justin Burke, they created this, this uh, muscle electrode where they showed that by, in certain situations, culturing cells in a tiny little two millimeter by two millimeter dish with 64 little electrical points coming out of it, they could actually demonstrate signals that are generated. But the interesting thing, it's almost like a Mexican wave. It starts from one side and it moves down. It starts from the other side and comes back. There's no reason for these cells to behave that way, but they do. They talk to each other. And so my thinking is, well, if they talk to each other, and we can predict how they talk, can we not harness that signal and convert it into something purposeful in the hand? So I got that group to talk to Denny, the robotics guys, and say, why don't you guys just get together and see if you can do that? So they can actually grow cells on these microarrays, collect the signals, program them, and get that to drive the hand. As a first example of how cells can interface with machinery to produce robotic function. So now we have to bridge the gap of the nerve that's been cut and how we, we, we guide it down. And this is where we're working with, with uh, Mario. Mario's from Texas, University of Texas in Dallas. And his group has looked specifically at how you span the big gaps that you find in nerves that have been traumatized. And he can span 15 centimeter gaps now, and he's even using Bluetooth to send signals backwards and forwards, a way of getting past the issues 
of sweat and so on and so forth. But let's just move further afield. We've talked about muscles, we've talked about nerves. What about cartilage, for example? And so what we're trying to do is how do you deal with cartilage that's been damaged to prevent it from becoming arthritic? Or how do you replace when you resect these? So two of my other registrars, this is Ken Yi and Raid Fellenban, their job was to find a source of stem cells that could be converted to cartilage and be converted easily. So they found that in the knee, in the little fat pad that we all have in the knee actually houses stem cells that can be driven down the pathway to create a number of things, one of which is cartilage. And once they were able to find the secret herbs and spices, which I can't tell you about, to make cartilage, we then say, well, we, we need a structure. So let's talk to my good mate, Gordon Wallace and his team at the University of Wollongong, because they're pretty good. He's the director of the Intelligent Polymer Research Institute. And together with his team, he put together a method of printing out a structure into which we can put our cells. And we were able to grow cartilage in these structures, little wafers of cartilage, as it were. And we tried it as a proof of principle, implanting it in an experimental model, and demonstrated that we were able to heal cartilage to a degree using this. So one day, Gordon and I, and we meet perhaps every three weeks or so. If anyone wants to join us for a cup of coffee, it starts at 5.30 in the morning at the basement of the Sofitel because that's the only cafe that's open at 5.30 in Melbourne. <laughs> and both of us are reasonably busy, so we meet at 5.30, we go to about 7, and we have coffee, and we solve all the problems of the world. And as my, as my uh, researchers say, as long as you only triple my workload, I'll kiss your feet. So we sit there and we talk, and one day I said to Gordon, Gordon, wouldn't it be great? You've got these huge printers on the table. Wouldn't it be great if you just had it in your hand? And the surgeon just go in there and just, you know, sculpt this thing. And that whole handheld device could print live cells with the right matrix and produce cartilage at the end of it. So, so Gordon, in, in his inimitable style, said, yeah, sure, that's not a problem. And anyone who knows Gordon, he, he's an absolutely can-do guy. And so we, we developed this concept of coaxial um, and how it might be used. And that blue that you see in the center is the core, which contains the live cells, and the pink or the red around it is, is the shell that keeps it solid as we print it into the defect. And Gordon's team really were pioneers in this and drove the development of this. We were able to then harness that together with our stem cell work and, and translate that into a product that we could use, and this is in, in a large animal model, showing proof of principle, feasibility, and also results that show that perhaps the handheld healing is much better than if you printed it and then put it in, if you printed it on a bench, scurried across to the lab and popped it into the, into the model, or this thing called microfracture, which we do today, which you just punch holes in the area of bad cartilage and hope it grows out versus doing nothing. So when we had a look at all that, the handheld device certainly demonstrated that it was quite capable of, of fixing the problem. So recognizing we could do that, we said, well, wouldn't it be great for our patients if we could just do that day only? We go in, we take the stem cells, we shake it in the bottle, and we do the same thing. But how many times could we possibly do that? We can't always go backwards and forwards harvesting doing the same process. Because that's when we thought about cell banking. Wouldn't it be great if we could just multiply the cells out and store them aside and do that? And that's where our collaboration with Paul Stoddart, Simon Moulton, and the team came. Yesh here was the PhD in that, in that um, experiment over the last number of years, and really came up with this, with this great idea of how to harness a concept of using particles with a certain surface area to multiply the capacity of, of, um, of cells or cell culture and do it in a way that doesn't harm the cell when you release it, the so-called biospheres. And together the group of the University of Melbourne, Swinburne, Wollongong and St Vincent's Hospital were one of the first to get from MRFF a Biomedtech Horizons grant. And, and I think as a group we're really proud that we could actually, we had a vision that we could bring together and our test is in two years' time to have a product that's ready for first in human trials. So the future of, of advances in healthcare reminds me a little bit about the space race. When Vostok 1 went up, 
our mates in America said, well, you may be first up, but we're going to be first on the moon. And then when they were matched, they said, well, we're going to build a place up in space where we can do things. And when that was matched, they said, well, we're going to build a shuttle that'll take us backwards and forwards between Earth and that place. And then they soon realized they were all running out of money. And programs were being shut down, and there's nothing, you know, there's other concerns. And that's when they realized, as all of us do today, that the only way we're going to have the platform for the future is if we do it together. And so the International Space Station really resembles that collaboration of all interested parties building their part of the space station, and we bring it together in one site. So the Advanced Limb Reconstruction Program, which I lead, is such. No one group can do this, and it's really reliant on a consortium of like-minded people who inspire each other every day when we get together. And it's only because of that team that we're able to achieve this. This was nothing more than an idea that we had perhaps 10 years or so ago. And since that time, we've actually built our version of the space station. We have a translational laboratory at St. Vincent's Hospital. One whole floor of the Department of Surgery was gutted to build this place that allow all university participants to come together. And there's nothing more joyous than seeing students from five different universities standing next to each other at the bench doing the sorts of work that drives. This is not a discovery lab. The discovery occurs at the home laboratories where the experts are. This is a translational lab. This is where we bring it together. And that's actually where the joy is in doing that. And the important thing about that is it sits directly opposite the hospital. So as researchers, we have our eye totally on the ball. This is why we're here. And as a clinician, I know that sitting in that area there is a powerhouse of thinkers who can help me solve problems. And because of that collaboration, we've been successful at getting a whole suite of, of really good grants that will help drive us into the future. What this represents is a showcase, I believe, of the concept of the Aiken Head Centre for Medical Discovery at St Vincent's Hospital. That is a consortium of a, a wide number of, of universities and institutions, all aiming to provide engineering solutions for human disease. And that is what we believe Australia can offer the rest of the world by coming together, each with our expertise in answering that one question. There are very few places in the globe, certainly none in Australia, that have brought people together like this. We have a huge legacy tradition behind us. Melbourne is the only place on the globe that has both the bionic eye and the bionic ear. We should be so proud of that as a group that has really generated that interest. And since then, we have our tissue engineers at the O'Brien Institute, we have our limb regeneration work, we have Dr. Mark Cook and a huge um, consortium of neuroscientists looking at how you can control um, brain dysfunction by biomaterials and implants. And none of this could be possible, of course, without tremendous support and you will see there the support from the home institutions which really have been quite outstanding. And if, if NHMRC or ARC or the government need any proof of it, they only have to come to a place like our advanced biofabrication facility, which represents the dreams of all those people who contribute to the Aiken Head of what we're hoping to achieve. And so I hope in, in this this short time I've given you the personal journey, as it were, where I started off. It was a simple start, but I might I say it's the, it's the start for me now of a tremendous period. It's a real renaissance period now, as what's holding us back is not so much our imagination, but technology. And you rest assured that technology changes every two or three years. So what you tell me we can't do today, just be patient. In two or three years' time, we'll be singing a different story. Thank you very much.